Hello, my name is Chris Uzenik, and I am a Pearson Educational Consultant who specializes in conducting and interpreting research and using it to guide practices within our schools. Today, as part of our math learning series, I will be reviewing research on interventions and strategies used to help students with difficulties in mathematics. I will begin this presentation by reviewing some information that has just been released by the National Center for Learning Disabilities. Next, I will provide a definition of common terms that will be used in the review of the research in this presentation. Next, I will review the most current meta-analysis examining studies reporting on the effectiveness of interventions used to support and instruct students who have difficulties in mathematics. Finally, I will review several studies on a new promising computer-based intervention designed generally to help students with math, math difficulties and specifically to improve the development of math skills in students with dyscalculia. Several weeks ago, the National Center for Disabilities released a report and web summary on the state of learning disabilities. They discussed the fact that one in five students have learning and intentional issues that interfer interfere with the instructional process and impact their academic performance. They also found that only a small subset receive specialized instruction or accommodations. Only one in 16 have an IEP for their specific learning disability. And only one in 50 of these, one in five students, receive accommodations. But they also indicated, as we all are aware, there are millions of children with learning and attentional issues that are not formally identified. Here are some prevalence rates for common learning disability issues. Dyslexia is found in about 5% to 17% of our students. Dyscalculia has been found in 5% or 7 per to 7% of our students, while dysgraphia has been found in 7% to 15% of our students. Dyspraxia in about 5 or 6% of our students, and ADHD's prevalence rate is 5% to 11%. It's important to note when looking at these issues that there are many comorbid issues that, were, that are found in students. It is important to keep in mind that many children have more than one learning or attentional issue. For example, researchers have found that dyslexia and dyscalculia can co-occur in 30 to 70% of the children who have either disorders. Studies also indicate as many as 45% of the children identified with attention deficit also have a learning disability. One of the main impacts of learning disabilities is seen in student academic performance. In this slide, results from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or the NAEP, is reported. This is from the 2013 administration of the NAEP. The NAEP is often referred to as the nation's report card. Every two years, it is used to assess reading and math skills of a large nationally representative sample of, eight, of fourth and eighth graders and provides an 
important comparison across states. This is the result from the 2013 administration in reading. As we can see in fourth grade, while only 27% of students below students score below basic in reading are non-disabled students. 69% of students with any type of disability are in the uh, below basic scoring criteria. And 85% of students with specific disabilities are below basic. Similar discrepancies in performance are found in eighth grade, though for all student groups, the reading performance has improved slightly. Unfortunately for mathematics, the reverse is found, where all student groups perform more poorly in eighth grade than in fourth grade. And in eighth grade, 74% of students with specific learning disabilities were in the below basic category of performance as compared to 21% of their non-disabled cohorts. These results indicate the importance of providing support for all students in mathematics as they move through the elementary school grades, and even more individualized and continuous support for students with disabilities. Interventions which can be used within a multi-tiered framework would be optimal. In this slide, I'm presenting the citation of that report that I just discussed, as well as the website. This will be available in the handout that will accompany this presentation. In this next section, what I want to do is I want to define some of the terms that I'll be using in the rest of the presentation, some terms that are specific to the research that I have reviewed and, and presenting here. The first term to define is a diagnostic one that in common that is common through the research and is used in this present that is used in this presentation is the term dyscalculia most educators are familiar with the term dyslexia and understand that it is a specific learning disability that is neurological in origin and is often characterized by difficulties with making the complex connections between letters sounds struggles with accurate and or fluid word recognition, poor spelling, and poor decoding abilities. Similarly, dyscalculia, a less familiar term, is a brain-based condition that makes it hard to make sense of numbers and math concepts. Students showing signs of dyscalculia often struggle with learning and retaining math facts and concepts. They experience more issues with transferring math knowledge into application and reasoning. They often struggle with working memory in that they can't remember the numbers and procedures involved in multiple step word problems. After repeating, stumbling, and failing, students often think they are not good at math and the stress and anxiety and frustration accompanying these negative feelings tends to make the problem worse. The challenges they encounter can also impact their daily life activities, such as counting and making change, following directions, keeping and managing time, recalling schedules, and other math-related tasks. Difficulties in math are not all dyscalculia. And dyscalculia appears to be a problem with the inability to judge quantities. Dyscalculia also appears to be a deficit found in the parietal lobe of the brain. The 
the publication of the most recent DSM-5, which is considered the universal authority on classification and diagno diagnosis of learning disabilities and other psychiatric disorders, added updates to the classification and recommenda recommendations for diagnosis of specific learning disabilities. Dyslexia and dyscalculia have been included as specific learning disabilities in the current DSM. Difficulties with number sense, memorization, and recall of arithmetic facts, fluidity and accuracy in math computations, and accurate math reasoning and applications are included in the description of the disability. Multiple resources are used in the diagnosis including interviews with parents and educators, teachers' perceptions and assessments, standardized tests and assessments, and student grades and performance. Research has identified the numerical arithmetic skills that present particular difficulty to children with dyscalculia. The acquisition, recall, and application of numerical arithmetic knowledge, including numeral, spatial, conceptual, and both factual and procedural arithmetic, arithmetic knowledge, wrong or inappropriate applications of calculating strategies, difficult generalizing learned content, little or no knowledge transfer of learned content to other tasks or problem areas without external help. Just like dyslexia, symptoms of dyscalculia can vary greatly, but might include trouble understanding quantity and that numbers represent quantities, trouble recognizing numbers and their equivalent written word, weak working memory, weak number sense in terms of ordering and identifying number patterns, no feel for numbers, like which is more or which is less, unable to make accurate estimations, reordering numbers when writing them, unable to make conjectures and assumptions from facts, information, or graphics, lacks fluidity with the application of math rules and operations, difficulties with counting and sequencing, little memory of basic facts or over-reliance on counting into the middle and upper grades, difficulty recognizing number patterns, weak in visual and spatial orientation, and difficulty telling time, making change, following schedules, and other math-related daily activities, and expressions of anxiety with these math tasks are common. Okay, the next term, or the next two terms, actually, meta-analysis and effect size, are research design in statistical terms and are related and often used together to review and report previously completed research on a specific topic. Meta-analysis is a method for sy systematically combining pertinent qualitative and quantitative study data from several selected studies to develop a single conclusion that has greater statistical power. There are three main ways researchers review empirical literature. The most common is a narrative review. It's not very rigorous, and researchers focus on a very basic topic. For example, they may focus on generally on math difficulties. The systematic reviews are more rigorous than narrative reviews. They focus on a single research question. For example, does a single intervention improve math performance in students with math difficulties. Where meta-analysis 
are quantitative and more rigorous than both of these other types of reviews. In addition to providing an overview, these papers provide a quantitative assessment on how well different interventions works, works with different types of math difficulties. Meta-analysis brings a high level of discipline to the research review process. The emphasis is on accumulating data as opposed to conclusions and compels reviewers to become intimately acquainted with the research and evidence. Meta-analysis can provide definitive answers to questions regarding the nature of an effect, even in the presence of conflicting findings. In principle, meta-analysis offers a more objective, disciplined, and transparent approach to assimilating findings than other reviews. Here are the steps that are used, the basic steps that are used in meta-analysis. The first step is to define the eligibility criteria for the data to be included. The criteria will, be de will define how compatible the articles need to be to be selected to be included in the review. This will be based on the quality of trials, the type of trials, the subjects, the outcomes, and the length of follow-up. The second step is to delineate a strategy for identifying the relevant studies it is important in combination with the eligible criteria to outline what will be the best strategy according to your research question and the relevance of your study to select the studies to be included in your analysis. Particularly, you should consider the inclusion of unpublished studies due to bias effects that are often associated with published studies as will be described further in this presentation. The third step is to create a standardized form of data collection where when extracting the data, the most reliable methods would be to use two independent observ observ observers. From these steps, there are scales that have been designed to assess the quality of, for example, clinical trials. Further, the individuals who will be responsible for rating the study should be blind to all the factors that could influence their assessment, namely the authors and institutions, the name of the journals, and the source of the funding of the research. The first, fourth step is to standardize individual results for comparison between studies. After you've collected the data, in order to compare the results, you'll need to standardize them on something common between the studies. In mathematics, this is often done by using standardized assessment results. The final step is to calculate the overall effect by combining the data. In line with the previous step, the data is combined and then effect size analysis is used to determine the overall effect. Data by themselves are not evident of anything until users bring concepts, criteria, theories of action, and interpretive frames of reference to make sense of the data. Meta-analysis is a method which can help accomplish this. Effect size is a simple way of quantifying, an effective, uh, quantifying the effectiveness of a particular intervention. It is often used as the statistic within the meta-analysis in order to determine, determine the effectiveness of different interventions. It is easy to calculate, readily understood, and can be applied to any measured outcome in education or social science. 
it allows us to move beyond the simplistic, does an intervention work, to the four more sophisticated view of how well does it work in a range of specific contexts. Moreover, by placing the emphasis on the most important aspects of an intervention, the size of the effect, rather than its statistical significance, it promotes a more scientific approach to the accumulation of knowledge. For these reasons, effect size is an important tool in reporting and interpreting the effectiveness of different interventions and programs. As you can see in this formula, the effect size is straightforward and transparent. It's a comparison of means between experimental or experimental group means with the control group means, or the group of students re receiving in an intervention versus those students who have not received that intervention, divided by a standard deviation or standard error measure. An effect size is exactly equivalent to a z-score distribution. Like the z-score normal distribution, effect size typically run from negative 4 to positive 4, with 99% of all scores falling between a negative 2.5 and a positive 2.5. For effect sizes, 0 0.40 and above are considered medium effects while 0 0.80 and above are considered strong effects, while 0 0.20 and above are considered at least acceptable. Again, in general, a small effect size is 0.2, a medium effect size is 0.5, and a large effect size is 0.8. As we can see in this effect size interpretation table, the percentage of a control group who would be below average would, oh, uh, the, it shows the percentage of a control group who would be below average in an, in an experimental group. So that if in an experimental group we have an effect size of 1.0, that would indicate that 84% of the control group would score below the average student in that treatment group. And again, effect sizes, when used, can give more information, more usable information, than measures of statistical significance. For example, if we look at a study that looked at seventh graders in a county school taking a specific reading exam, and they were found to be statistically insignificant difference between the two groups, the control group and the intervention group, you still might be able to find a specific effect size that would be considered to be in a medium, medium effect size and to show that while not significant, the intervention did improve, effectively improve the student's reading performance. Here are some examples of practices, programs, or interventions that have been found to have medium effect sizes through meta-analysis. For example, when a meta-analysis was used to evaluate social skills programs, and a medium effect size of 0.57 was found. Okay, in this next section, we're going to review the most recent meta-analysis used to collect studies on interventions, practices, and programs used to support students with math difficulties or disabilities. This study was conducted by Sabrina 
Dr. Dora and her colleagues. In her study, when talking about mathematical difficulties, it has become clear in the last years that a consistent definition is still lacking. Different terms are used in the research, such as dyscalculia, mathematical disability, mathematical difficulties, or at-risk dyscalculia. For that reason, Dr. Cordura and her colleagues used a broad definition of math difficulties in collecting the studies that they wanted to include in their meta-analysis with a main goal of this meta-analysis to incorporate these different terms under one quantitative umbrella. The primary studies for the analysis at hand have show, showed some different perspectives so that the following groups could be formed based on the theoretical focuses of the primary studies. In other words, the researchers collected neurological studies, studies on math, mathematical difficulties that were developmentally psychological in nature, instructional studies, empirically pr pragmatic studies that involved pragmatic interventions, Further, research interventions were categorized with respects to the math competencies pr promoted. These content levels were distinguished as mathematical prepar preparatory skills, such as counting knowledge and number sense, basic arithmetic competencies, such as addition, subtraction, multi multiplication, and division, problem solving or the application of mathematical knowledge in new situations, and then finally, interventions. Were classified by their instructional procedures so that we had direct interventions, strategy instruction, self-instruction, and assisted performance. The researchers used the following research questions. What types of interventions are helpful for children with mathematical difficulties? Which children do especially, do especially benefit from mathematical interventions? Are specific interventions helpful for specific children, especially for children with dyscalculia or at-risk dyscalculia and learning disabilities? The figure on this slide shows the steps that were used in order to select the studies that were to be included in the meta-analysis. The first step was to look at, the, look at three of the major research databases, and they were searched to identify studies that included interventions that address mathematic difficulties. Then these studies were pared down using a screening criteria based on the study goals, which was the study goals, which included aiming to foster math achievement, the student's age, in this case, ages 6 through 12, I mean, not ages 6 to 12. They were also pared down to just include at least one primary outcome measure that was measured mathematic, mathematical achievement. And it was, they were also pared down to include only studies that were pre-post design and had experimental and control groups. The studies were further pared down to include students that provide to include only studies that provided 
comprehensive descriptions of the interventions. And that included enough measurements to co compute effective effect sizes. Also, to include only studies that had student groups that had at least 10 subjects in them. After these studies were pared down, the final result was that there were 35 studies from almost 1,600 studies initially identified that were included in the final meta-analysis. Here's a chart of the effect sizes found in each of the 35 studies. Effect sizes ranged from a negative 0.55 to a positive 3.16, with most of the effect sizes in the medium range between 0 0.40 and 0 0.80. The results of the meta-analysis found the following, that both theory-based theory and empirically pragmatic interventions showed significant effects, that computer-based interventions were de determined to be effective, that instructional types, the instructional types that were most effective were direct and assistant, strategy-based and self-instruction were not as effective. in terms of instructional procedures, basic arithmetic competencies were found to be most effective, while problem solving and mathematical preparatory skills were not. When combining the 35 studies, the overall effect size that the authors found was a 0.83, or a strong effect size. However, the variance between interventions was high. Therefore, aggregating value, the, therefore, generalizing the results have, ha, has to be done carefully. Additionally, no specific theoretical approach or foundation emerged within the research. Also, addressing basic numerical competencies through, through the training of students was found to be effective. Additionally, no specific performance profile emerged for students in these studies. Okay, in the next section, I would like to discuss some research that is specific to an intervention called Diebuster Calcularis. Two of the studies included in the previous meta-analysis I, I discussed, or were included in the previous meta-analysis that I just discussed. And also, a third study that was not included in that meta-analysis will be discussed. Diebuster Calcularis is a mathematical learning software system. It re represents a unique way of assisting the brain in essential learning and matru maturation process. Calcularis combines cutting-edge findings from neuroscience and neuropsychology with tried and tested principles from the fields of computer science. This program 
addresses the fundamental underlying cognitive and processing skills that facilitate the development of basic mathematical skills, including representation of cardinal magnet magnitude, the learning process of associating a perceived number to a spoken word, Arabic sim sim symbolization of numbers, and the internalizing of these systems in the formation of an abstract spatial number representation, or the development of a mental number line. Some of the features and benefits of Diebuster Calcularis are it is personalized, it is a game-based learning environment, it includes independent training where children work independently at their computer, it has vi video tutorials, it includes a reward system where completed sections and successfully learned contents are rewarded with points, helping motivate the students to continue in the learning process. It also involves an internalized assessment process that provides progress monitoring. The first study that I want to report on is one that looked at the impact that Diebuster Calcularis had on students with developmental dyscalculia in terms of their mental number line training. A growing body of research advocates the importance of the number line as a mechanism for helping children develop greater flexibility in mental arithmetic. It is an essential tool for actively constructing mathematical meaning, number sense, and understanding of number relationships. An internal representation of a correct linear number line is fundamental for the development of more complex arithmetic abilities. Individual differences in children's learning of the linear mathematical number line have been correlated with mathematical achievement across grades. Specifically, the level of development of the internal representation of the number line is positively related to academic performance in mathematics, both in grades and on tests of academic achievement. Kushian, the author of this study, investigated whether or not children with developmental dyscalculia would improve their internal representation of numbers and consequently show better performance on mathematical tasks after completing a computer-based computer training. In this study's design, 16 children with developmental dyscalculia, mean age of 9.6 years, and 16 age-matched control children participated in the study. None of the children in either group were identified as having a neurological or psychological disorder because the more sophisticated spatial representation is assumed to rely on a linear number representation. The research, researchers hypothesized that children would show improvement on a number line task as well as other measures of, of mathematical performance. As we can see in the design, initially all students were tested. They were also measured using brain imaging devices in order to determine what areas of the brain um, were involved in estimation abilities, and numeric understanding. The training was, was affected to influence both the process measured by these brain imaging as well as the performance on the actual math assessments.
after the initial training, there was a five. But there was also a five-week additional training for those students with um, developmental dyscalculia. Okay, in the summary of the results, we've the researchers found that calculus, calculus training or using diebuster calculators helped children with developmental dyscalculia and children in a control group improve on their overall mathematical performance. When performance on specific areas of mathematical skills, linearity and variability of numbers in the, in the number line development were evaluated, the training had a greater impact on children with developmental dyscalculia. Their performance after training approximated that of control cohorts in those areas. As we can see, the effect size for effect sizes measured on the test of mathematical performance for this study was a 0 0.50 or a medium effect size. The positive training effects seemed to persist for at least five weeks after the training and the brain imaging effects indicated that after five weeks of training mathematical tasks used in the study put less demand on processing centers found in executive functioning, working memory, and required less attentional effort, especially for those students with developmental dyscalculia. The second study that's reviewed in this presentation is modeling and optimizing the process of learning mathematics. It too involved using diebuster calculators with students to improve their mathematical skills. The authors conducted a study which provides a, descrip a description of the program diebuster calculators, which incorporates the cognitive processes of mathematical development within a predictive network that facilitates the optimization of learning. This is a company accomplished through a predictive automatic network which enables a significant level of cognitive stimulation while fitting tasks to the user's contextual characteristics.